You may be familiar with Markov cohort models, but do you know how they differ from semi-Markov models? At the end of this video, you'll be able to distinguish the two models, so let's break it down. Markov models use disease states to represent all possible consequences of an intervention of interest. These disease states are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, and so each individual represented in the model can be in one and only one of these disease states at any given time. For example, imagine a cancer patient in one of three health states. They could either be progression-free, progressed or dead. If we assume that our cancer patient starts off in the progression-free health state, they will eventually transition to the progressed health state as their disease worsens over time. In a Markov model, time itself is considered as discrete time periods called cycles, and movements from one disease state to another are represented as transition probabilities. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Markov models assume that transitions depend only on the current state, not on how the patients got there. This is known as the memoryless property, meaning that the model doesn't remember the patient's past journey. It only cares about where they are right now. Let me paint you a picture to illustrate the memoryless property of Markov models. Imagine a drunken person trying to find their way home after a long night out. Because of their intoxication, they're wavering from side to side, not entirely in control of where they go next. Let's assume they can already see their house and need to walk in a straight line to get there. However, the wavering causes them to deviate ever so slightly to the left or right with each step. If we consider the drunken person's steps as a chain of events, we can see that the direction of their next step, whether they waver left or right, doesn't really depend on how they got to their current position in the first place. In other words, their future movement depends only on where they are right now, not on the steps they've taken to reach that point. This random walk analogy of the drunken person is a great way to illustrate the memoryless property of Markov models. Future steps depend only on the current position, not on the past. So just like the drunken person's next steps depend only on their current position, Markov models work in a similar way. Future states depend only on the present, not on how they arrived there. But what if we take it a bit further? What happens if we relax the assumption of the memoryless property of Markov models? This is where we venture into the realm of semi-Markov models or semi-Markov processes. Semi-Markov models also follow the Markov property in terms of state transitions, but the difference lies in how the time between state transitions is handled. So the time spent in a state before transitioning can vary in a semi-Markov model, whereas in Markov models, the time between transitions is typically fixed. This can be expressed using a state transition diagram of a discrete time semi-Markov process, where individuals can move freely between three health states. What you can see is that the probability of transitioning expressed as P is not only affected by existing state membership, but also by a so-called holding factor H. This holding factor keeps track of how long patients spend in a given health state and adjusts the transition probabilities accordingly. Note that if we focus only on the transitions and ignore the time between transitions, we will have a standard Markov process. But since we're including holding times, it's a semi-Markov process. Now you may wonder why this matters. Let's come back to our oncology example from earlier to understand why this distinction is so important. In a Markov model, the probability of transitioning from PFS to progress disease is constant and does not depend on how long the patient has been in the PFS health state. If the transition probability is set to 10% per month, it stays at 10% every month, regardless of whether the patient has been in PFS for one month or 12 months. In contrast, when we look at the semi-Markov model, we see that the transition probability from PFS to progressed disease is influenced by the duration the patient has spent in the PFS health state. For example, if a patient has been in the PFS health state for just one month, the probability of progressing might be low, but if instead they've been in the PSF health state for 12 months, the probability of progression might be higher because the risk of disease progression often increases over time. This reflects a more realistic clinical scenario where the longer a patient remains without disease progression, the higher the likelihood of eventually progressing. In fact, you could argue that a semi-Markov model in which all transitions include a time component reflects the clinical reality and interdependencies much better than a standard Markov model. 
Oftentimes, standard Markov models are good enough though, which is why they are so commonly used in practice. In case you want to learn how to build a simple Markov model in Excel, then you can check out my step-by-step -step guide on the topic, which you can see on screen right now.